Welcome and Shalom from Olive Tree Community Spokane. We are happy to welcome back our special guest speaker, David Dolan. David has spent many years in Israel as a broadcast journalist and has wonderful insights to share about Israel and the current events happening around the world as they relate to prophecies in the scriptures. Let's join David now as he starts his presentation to our community. Well, Shabbat Shalom to everyone and uh, those that are watching later when it's maybe not Shabbat, uh, Shabbat for the next one that's coming up. Shalom, I mean, for that. Um, it's a period of not much shalom in the world or in the United States or pretty much anywhere in the Middle East. And I'll be touching on some of the um, developments that have occurred since I last was blessed to share with you in mid-March. A lot has taken place over the past uh, four months, and I'll be uh, commenting on what's going on. But I want to begin, as I always uh, do when I speak anywhere, with some scripture. And I prayed to the Lord this morning to show me what he wanted me to share. And um, I went to uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible. Uh, because, of course, the title in my Bible of the whole chapter is Israel's Mourning, uh, not mourning in the day, but a mourning, its sorrow turned to joy. And I could read the whole thing, but I'll just read a few verses from verse 7. For thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chiefs of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O Lord, save your people. O oh Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. God answers, behold, I'm bringing them from the north country. And I'll talk about that in a second. And I will gather them from the remote parts of the earth. That would be Spokane, almost as far away from Israel as you can get on earth. Actually, Hawaii is the exact opposite, 12 hours behind time zones and the other side of the earth. I'll gather them from the remote parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, <clears throat> the woman with child, and she who is in labor with child together. A great company, they will return here. Here, of course, being the Holy Land, Haaretz, the Lord's Land. With weeping, they will come. Much of that has occurred. And by supplication, I will lead them. I will make them walk by streams of water, on a straight path in which they will not stumble, for I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Now, this is for all the doubters around the world who uh, hate Zion and are trying to destroy uh, Israel, often in the name of God, of Allah, or whatever, and it's uh, uh, not what the God of the Bible says he's going to do. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations and declare in the coastlands afar off, and say, he who scattered Israel will, not maybe, not might, will gather him. He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and redeemed him from the hand of him who was stronger than he. Well, I spoke last time a little bit uh, of my uh, many years of journalism work in Israel. I lived there 33 years. I like to tell people the same length that uh, Yeshua did. Uh, I moved back to the States. He obviously went to the cross and then uh, arose to heaven from the Mount of Olives and will be coming back there uh, soon, one of these days. And for CBS, uh, I covered a bunch of wars. I mentioned that last time. And watching the news these days with uh, Ukraine every day and the bombings and stuff. It's hard for me because it's hard for everyone, but um, I have some post-traumatic stress syndrome, no doubt about it. Uh, I love the 4th of July and I hate it. I hate it because of the fireworks and the explosions. And especially people start setting off fireworks around where I am uh, on, on a lake, near a lake. Uh, a couple days beforehand, and I was sitting on my porch not expecting a big boom, and it suddenly happened, and I hit the deck. Uh, and some of my vet friends do the same thing, because, of course, most of the time when I heard something like that, 
it was uh, incoming rockets or outgoing fire or whatever. Uh, I was thinking this morning, I think I covered five or six wars, the 82 Lebanon War, uh, the 87 to 91, 92 uh, Palestinian first uprising, the 91 Scud attacks from our friend Saddam upon uh, Israel. I was working for CBS in those days and I went out on my balcony with my microphone and got some live action sound of a scud going over Jerusalem. You could hear it whistle. It wasn't very far above us. Uh, Jerusalem's 2,500 feet up and it landed in nearby Tel Aviv. Well, 35 miles away, but the explosion was so loud I could hear it. And I got it on my recording and I uh, called the network and said, hey, I have some great action sound of the scuds landing, natural sound, we called it in the business. And uh, my producer said, what the heck are you doing outside on your balcony? You're supposed to be in your sealed room, which, by the way, was my most convenient room in the house, my bathroom. And you can figure out maybe why if you have to stay a few hours in any room. Also, it didn't have an outside window, the only room in my apartment like that. So that's where I was with sealed tape around the door every time the sirens went off. And um, I covered that. And then, of course, we had uh, several more wars. We had the uh, 96 uh, Hezbollah war. That happened again in 2006. Uh, we had the second Palestinian uprising from 2000 on. Uh, I was in the middle of a, a lot of terror attacks and things. So, you know, that's just uh, the background. So the 4th of July bomb bo uh, booms uh, uh, bother me and uh, the dog. But uh, I get, get through it, got through it. And um, I wanted to say, though, that the uh, best part of working for CBS, I worked for them for 12 years, was uh, reporting biblical prophecy. I mentioned this last time, uh, being fulfilled. And uh, in particular, the massive aliyah from the former Soviet Union that began in 1991, uh, three years after I started with CBS, I did dozens of stories about that Aliyah, that going up to Zion. Uh, it turned out to be over a million uh, Jews, and some of their spouses weren't Jewish, mostly Jewish, coming from Russia, coming from Ukraine, many from Ukraine, coming from all over the former Soviet Union as the Soviet Union collapsed, of course, in 91, and the doors swung open for uh, Natan Sharansky and others to come back to Israel. And <laughs> I loved doing those stories, uh, going down to the airport and interviewing people getting off the plane, because I knew that was fulfilling the scriptures I just read. I will say to the North, <laughs> give them up. And to the South, do not hold them back. That's later on in the same chapter. But he's proclaiming to the nations that he's going to do this. And it happened. So um, that was great, but the wars weren't so good, uh, obviously, to cover. And um, when, we last, uh, when I last spoke to you, the war in Ukraine was just uh, a few weeks old. Uh, I mentioned that I thought it would go on uh, and be a very, very serious. We all knew it was going to be serious, but it's become, now five months later, uh, a true East-West war. Uh, President Biden said this week again that the U.S. is at war. He's right. It is. Uh, over the 4th, I hosted my family for a barbecue. And my uh, brother, who was a, I mentioned last time, he was a pastor for many years in Washington State on the west side. And then uh, in um, Whitworth, he was a professor for many years. And back east the past couple of years doing the same thing. But he's home now. And his son-in-law is a, a Air Force Navy pilot. He's uh, at the Pentagon. He's actually on the staff of General Milley, the chief of staff. And he's been there for several years. He doesn't like the desk job as much as he did flying. Well, he's getting his wish because they called him and a bunch of other uh, pilots that haven't been flying but doing desk jobs. Uh, to, to a refresher course down in Oklahoma last month where they flew for a month and learned the newest things and whatever, uh, so that they'd be ready for combat. And uh, he's being shipped to uh, Southeast England to the big US Air Force base there. And he'll, he's a refueling pilot mainly, but he'll undoubtedly be flying into the continent 
and involved in the war. And um, you may have seen this or not, but uh, Vladimir Putin made a very um, explosive uh, statement to his parliament on Thursday of this week, saying that we've just begun. Basically, you haven't seen anything yet. He called out the West for a, a proxy war against Russia. Well, the West didn't initiate anything against Russia. That's absurd. He invaded his neighbor Ukraine with the declared intention of destroying it. Well, there's another country that faces total destruction and hears about it a lot, and that's, of course, Israel, with Iran vowing all the time it's going to wipe the Jewish state off the face of the earth, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But Putin's statement was very frightening. He indicated that this is just the beginning, as I said, that there's going to be much more. That's what the analysts are now uh, saying. He has tested his public. They're basically being fed a bunch of garbage on their television and, and news programs, a lot of propaganda and one-sided stuff. But they're mostly believing it, the polls show. He's revved up the nationalism in Russia, and he's on the warpath, and he's going to continue. They've taken a pause uh, the last couple of weeks as they're regrouping, and the reports today, they're uh, uh, repositioning all sorts of reserve soldiers. They're calling them up from across their vast country, stretching from Alaska to Europe, and uh, they're placing them on the border with Ukraine, and it's expected in August there'll be another major offensive launched. Uh, Ukraine has gotten over $60 billion of Western aid, uh, some of the, um, not the best equipment always, but some of it is very sophisticated. It's definitely kept them in the game. Uh, we were all happy to see that uh, the Russians uh, reversed course on their way to Kiev, where they were planning to oust uh, Zelensky, the uh, Jewish uh, president of um, Ukraine and uh, set up a puppet government like they did in 2008. I won't go into that, but this isn't a new thing, of course. And um, now he's taken about a third of the country and made that land bridge that I predicted he would do to um, the uh, Crimea Peninsula and uh, is staging to take over Odessa, has stopped all shipments of grains from Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is the number one grain provider for Egypt, a country of, of I think, 80 million now. I've, I haven't looked recently, but uh, for Algeria, for Morocco, for those North African countries, for quite a few of the Black African countries further south, uh, for many of the Arab countries in the Middle East, for a good part of India, they get uh, a good portion of their grain uh, and other things, olive oil, and we've heard about the fertilizers, uh, plants there that are not producing or they're not able to ship. Russia's stolen, stealing some of the grain and shipping it out themselves, but mainly to Syria, their ally Syria, so that it doesn't suffer. They want those Syrian soldiers strong and hardy for the war that's coming against Israel, I'm sad to say, but the Bible does tell us that as well, so that's on the horizon at some point. But uh, in the meantime, it goes on. And um, he's reaffirmed in his speech a couple of weeks ago, Putin, that uh, I'll call him Putin, but it's actually Putin. Uh, but you kind of is something I would associate with what he's doing. <laughs> it smells it's terrible what he's doing. And uh, obviously going after civilians deliberately and uh, we have no idea how many thousands have been slaughtered by hitting schools and hospitals and all these shopping malls and all these things he's doing along with some military targets, but most of his targets have been civilians. And in fact, he's depopulated the Ukrainian population from the eastern third of the country. There's trains going every day to the west taking people out. Uh, the men remain to fight for the most part, uh, the, the, not the kids and not the elderly, but everyone else. And um, uh, he's moving on. But in his speech, he compared himself to Peter the Great. And I had just read earlier this year a novel about the Romanov dynasty, and in particular, the last Romanov family that were slaughtered by the communists and uh, that whole thing after World War I, 1917. And um, 
Uh, Peter the Great was uh, talked about a lot in it. And of course he founded St. Petersburg, which became the capital of Russia. They moved it from Moscow to the West, to the Baltic Sea, right below Norway, right next to Sweden, not far from Sweden. Denmark's just down the water a little bit. Poland's right next door. And next to that is Germany. So that is um, the Western capital, the European capital, it was called, of Russia. Still, of course, a great city. And it went, was called Leningrad. And then it went back to uh, St. Petersburg uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union. And he made clear that he's going to uh, make that, again, a great capital, a, a great city, greater than it is now, and move some of his government functions there. and. Uh, he wants the Baltic states back that are right next to it, that are right south of it. Uh, Estonia being directly south of it and Lithuania, uh, one of the three being right next to Kaliningrad, which is the little Russian statelet right on the Baltic Sea. Most people don't even know about it, but it's a tiny little area about the size of Rhode Island, heavily militarized, heavily, and the Russians have their Western fleet base there. And uh, they, uh, the Lithuanian government stopped shipments of new arms, etc., by train that were going through Lithuanian territory. They halted those uh, last month, and Putin is very happy about it. So it's almost guaranteed he's going to invade there at some point. And he doesn't have a shared border with Lithuania, apart from, from um, uh, Kaligrat, I have to remember the name. Uh, but he does with Estonia and Latvia, and uh, he has a shared border, and the capitals are just a few hours in. It's nothing like Ukraine, tiny little countries compared to Ukraine. His forces can march in there and take it over in two or three days like we thought he might do in Ukraine, but he fought, found resistance there. Well, of course, those three are NATO member countries. So when he goes into any of them, we will formally be, we meaning Canada, the United States, Norway, Great Britain, France, Spain, Italy, Germany, Poland, on and on. There's about 28 NATO members, I think. We'll all be at war formally with Russia. But uh, <clears throat> the fact that we are uh, involved in a proxy war, as he called it, uh, Putin called it, is becoming more evident every day. And my, uh, I hosted my... Um, brother's family, as well as other family on the 4th, as I said, and I got a chance to, as I always do, go aside with my um, niece's husband, who's in the, in the Air Force and at the Pentagon. So, I mean, he knows what's going on. And uh, we have a little private talk, uh, things that he won't even tell his wife, uh, that others wouldn't maybe even understand, but he knows I do. And so we will talk. And uh, he told me some things I've Obviously can't repeat because this will be on YouTube, but um, uh, it's frightening. It's war, it's real war, and it is the beginning definitely of a world war. And um, he uh, said he would carry on with that. And meanwhile, they announced, Russia did, and China did, and Iran did, they're planning to hold, hold a joint naval exercise with, ta-da, Venezuela in South America, on the northern coast of South America. They're going to hold the four countries joint military exercises just south of Florida and not too far from Jamaica and Haiti and all the other um, countries that are in the Caribbean. They're going to go around the Caribbean uh, all the way from Barbados, uh, north of Venezuela to the, the west. Uh, soon. They didn't announce a date, but it's going to be in August at some point, they said, uh, right off the U.S. coast. Well, obviously, that's extremely provocative. But more importantly, it shows again that the alliance that was announced at the beginning of this war when Putin flew to Beijing at the beginning of the Olympics and uh, met with the Chinese leadership, and they declared their basically full support for whatever he does, and that they understand his uh, uh, reasoning and they support him. Of course, why would they do that? Because they intend and will soon invade Taiwan. 
and take Taiwan, which they consider part of China. And of course it was until the communist revolution and the nationalists fled to the island of Taiwan. I've been there ever since. And um, China intends to take it back. And uh, Iran in that mix, well, again, that shows that the uh, Iranians, whenever they do uh, launch an attack against Israel, a full attack, I'll talk about some of the other stuff they're doing in a minute, but um, that uh, they will have the full backing of Moscow and Beijing for that war. Those are two very important allies. Of course, uh, half the world's population almost is in China alone, and uh, they're buying massive amounts of Iranian and Russian oil. Uh, you've all heard, all heard in the news that Russia is selling more oil than ever, despite the boycotts launched by uh, Biden and the West, um, because they're selling it to these other countries at a discount price, but they're making more than they were making at the start of the war, as the war has set the prices, as we all know very well, whenever we go to the gas pump, that's not the only reason, of course, the war, but it's a <clears throat> contributing factor, certainly for the world price of oil being consistently now over $100 a barrel for some time. <clears throat> so that's the situation uh, overall. And um, I mentioned last time that um, uh, I felt the next prophetic event on the calendar. I felt this for many decades, actually. I've written about it in a couple of my books, my untimed novel, The End of Days, but also in a uh, a book called Israel in Crisis, What Lies Ahead. I had a chapter on it that the prophecy in Isaiah 17, I think will be the next one fulfilled in the Middle East, next major prophecy fulfilled. Obviously the return of the Jews is the big one and that's going on every day, but a uh, specific prophecy about a specific thing. And this will be the war between Israel and Syria in which uh, we're told in Isaiah 17 that Damascus will be destroyed completely. No humans will be alive in it afterwards, and Israel suffered greatly, uh, like the shaking of an olive tree. And you're the olive tree congregation, by the way. I have two olive trees, believe it or not, even though I'm in the States. My cousin has a tree farm on the coast, and he sent them to me, and they're hardier than the ones in the Middle East. They can take a lot more cold, but still, one is in the house all the time in my living room. It's lovely, growing very well, and the other is outside in the summer and inside in the winter. Well, last winter, I forgot to water uh, for a while downstairs. It's in and a few other dormant plants were down there in my basement. And uh, all the leaves fell off and normally they come back in about March. And when I spoke to you in March, there were no leaves. I thought, oh, it's, it's dead. I've killed my outdoor olive tree. And April came and there were still no leaves and whatever. And then I started to notice a few little sprigs few little growth things here and there on it. And now it's outside. I wish I could take show you a picture. The leaves are growing all over it. It's come back to life fully. <laughs> and of course, that's a symbol of Israel's return, the olive tree. And uh, they're there and they're going to be there. But I'm going to say some pretty hard things now. I think that is going to happen next. And later, Psalm 83 will happen, I believe. The alliance of Arab countries, including the Palestinians, the Jordanians, the Saudis, uh, Lebanon is mentioned, Assyria, Assyria, which would be Iraq, um, but that will come later. And of course, it's not in place yet uh, because Jordan and Saudi Arabia is moving closer to Israel right at present, and that's good. And Biden is going there on uh, next Friday. He's going to Israel first on Thursday to meet with the acting prime minister. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Israel's internal political disastrous situation in a few minutes, but we can't have too much trauma all at once. But uh, he's meeting with the acting prime minister, Yair Lapid, instead of Naftali Bennett, who's resigned, of course, has announced he won't run again, and the latest polls show his party won't even make it into the next parliament, Knesset in Israel. So uh, a lot of his voters very upset with his alliance with the left and the narrow party and the things that went on in the year-long government that just fell. Uh, I didn't think it would last even that long. But at any rate, um, the um, uh, Psalm 83, I think, will come after that. There will be 
um, revolutions, those remaining Arab countries have peace with Israel. Egypt is not mentioned in that alliance, by the way. So I think that peace treaty will hold, but the one with Jordan and the Saudis will go back to the war path and others uh, that are listed in that um, prophecy. But the next chapter in Isaiah is Isaiah 18, obviously, after 17. And it's a short chapter, and it's a mystery chapter to many people. It speaks of a, a country with the people where the people are tall and smooth. It sends envoys by the sea all over the world, a people that are feared far and wide, respected, feared, a strong people, in other words, that have influence everywhere. And, uh, and it's called at the beginning a country that the rivers divide. And so people say, oh, that's Egypt or it's Ethiopia. Uh, the Euphrates goes through them. But uh, Egypt hasn't been a superpower for thousands of years. <laughs> Ethiopia never has been and never will be, I, I don't think. It doesn't have the finances or the, the depth. Of the... But of course, the United States has got something called the Mississippi River. Uh, it begins um, just um, west, uh, just east of Spokane, about 40 miles. I don't know if any of you knew that, but the headwaters of the Missouri River uh, are in western Montana. And uh, it flows down. Of course, the Continental Divide is the Idaho-Montana border, essentially. They got it. They messed it up in a couple of places. They, they guessed it and it was wrong. In when they got satellites, they could see it was a little different. But um, the water flows there and then down into the center part of the great continent, and of course then joins with the Ohio River and other rivers and becomes the great Mississippi River that uh, I've been over many times uh, in, on cars and spoken in Memphis and other places along the way. And it uh, is massive. And of course the United States has done those other things. Well, it sp speaks in Isaiah 7, 18 about the Lord um, apparently judging that great power that it will happen apparently in the summer when the uh, leaves are out and the ol olive leaves, it says, are out and they're ripening. The grapes are on and they're starting to ripen. And the Lord will, um, in the sizzling heat, will uh, bring apparently judgment to it, not destroy it. It says that pe those people will still be around to bring tribute to the Lord in the millennium in the kingdom of Yeshua on earth. But um, it apparently will be greatly weakened. I think we are facing that, folks. I think the Lord's been speaking to me for five years about it. Of course, he's been speaking to Jonathan Kahn about it for a long time. And he's written all about that in his Harbinger series. I mentioned, I think, last time I've known Jonathan since the early 90s. And I actually was speaking at a Messianic pastors conference in in. Um, Orlando, Florida in 2005, and I said that I felt the Lord showed me that some of you in this audience, and it was leaders of the Messianic movement, not, it wasn't a general conference uh, that, you know, the MJA conference, something, it was just the pastors and the rabbis, and uh, of course, Orlando in January, they all come from the north and love it down there, but uh, in that audience, I, I said to them, some of you, I believe, will become national leaders and spokesmen and prophets for this land and will give warnings to it, like the ancient Jewish prophets did. And probably the people won't heed them like they didn't in ancient Israel, but he'll raise up some of you to do that. I was speaking, among others, to Jonathan. He was in the audience. And of course, since then, he's become internationally known, but certainly in the country, often on television programs. He's spoken uh, in, the, in Washington at uh, huge rallies and met with senators and whatever. And the point of his whole thing, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, the harbingers is that the World Trade Center was a harbinger of potential destruction on America, of war coming against the country, of the hedge of protection being taken down around the country because, and he lists all the reasons, the millions of uh, babies that have been slaughtered, the uh, uh, crime that is just, I mean, the shooting. Uh, I'd been to, to uh, um, Parkland, uh, uh, you know, to the, um, what, what, I can't think of the name, 
in Illinois before and spoken there at the Jewish community that was attacked on the 4th of July. Uh, the town wasn't, half the victims were Jews, not surprisingly, because half the residents are Jewish in that uh, Highland Park, sorry. And um, I've been to some of the other venues, the hotel in Las Vegas where the mass shooting occurred, all of this. And uh, J the Japanese prime minister, former one, was just assassinated. And, you know, they have uh, one or two gun shootings a year. We have one or two an hour. Uh, even Spokane, as those of you who are watching from there know, uh, is having nearly daily shootings. Uh, now, in these days, it's just terrible. And there's other reasons uh, for that. But Israel has been uh, supported by the United States. God will remember that. In judgment, I believe he'll show mercy, but I do think the time is very near where it will be unleashed against us. And one thing, and only one thing, do the Chinese and the Russians and the Venezuelan communists, at least, and the Iranians and the Syrians and other uh, of their allies, one thing they share, hatred for the United States, a desire to see our freedom-loving country, uh, freedom of religion, freedom of press, freedom of speech. Now all those things, not total, but you know, more or less. Uh, and of course, our massive military capability, bases in the Philippines and in South America and in Australia and in uh, South Korea and Japan and all over the world. And they resent that. And uh, it, Putin made clear in his remarks on Thursday, if you haven't read them, you should look that up uh, on Fox, Fox's webpage. They have uh, the full text of what he said. Uh, he's basically saying, we're, we're in this for the long haul. We're going against the West. He said, the West will not determine the world order anymore. We will reset it and we will do it. So he's obviously spoken to the Chinese and the others about that. And uh, I think they've all agreed on a set time for Iran to launch an attack upon Israel. Um, I mentioned Isaiah 17. I think that that uh, will be during such a war with Iran because of course, Syria is under Iranian domination and Russian domination. Uh, Russia's pulled out uh, since March, a lot of its troops there to go fight in Ukraine, but they still have a lot there. And they're bringing in who? The Iranians to man the bases that these Russian troops were in uh, all over the place. But of course, Russia's keeping its major air and uh, naval port in Latakia on the Western Mediterranean, uh, on the Mediterranean in the west of Syria. And uh, Israel continues to bomb uh, Hezbollah. Reinforcements coming into Syria continues to attack um, uh, cargo ships carrying weapons for Hezbollah and for the Iranian forces in uh, Syria itself. There's some station right next to the Golan Heights. They're all over the country and Russia gives them free reign. And in the meantime, the past five months, the Russian statements against Israel, against Russia, against Israel doing those strikes have intensified. They've called in the Israeli ambassador a few times to say, stop that, quit it. We're not gonna tolerate it anymore. They've been doing joint uh, air flights with uh, the Syrian air force uh, right along the Israeli border. Uh, for all we know, there's Iranians on board as well. So that's coming, and, um, and I, I believe <clears throat> that the evidence is mounting that it will be coordinated with Russia and China, that they'll give the go-ahead, the, the say. And meanwhile, Iran just continues to push the edges of the envelope. And uh, are we okay there? I see a sign coming. Um, no, it's just the chat, so I'll keep chatting. Um, the... Um, just uh, last week, uh, last Shabbat, they sent three uh, unmanned drones. Well, drones always are unmanned. Basically, that's what they are, unmanned aerial vehicles, AVs, uh, UAVs. Uh, but uh, they were probably armed, and they were heading towards Israel's uh, Mediterranean uh, zone where they have a, a growing number of oil wells, gas heads, they're pulling up natural gas, et cetera. And one of the newest ones is close to what the Lebanese consider their, uh, their waters. 
and the U.S. is mediating between Lebanon and Israel right now, and they're near a solution, they say, uh, an actual line, a border that both sides will, will um, you know, honor. Uh, well, Israel will anyway, but Hezbollah has already announced no way. Any Israeli, anything out in the Mediterranean is fair game, fair target, and we're going to keep uh, after them. So they sent these three drones. They were coming close to the platform, uh, uh, F-16, U.S. F-16 under Israeli uh, pilots, uh, took down one of them and two Barak missiles. This is a new system based on Israel's ships, uh, a ship to air missile. Uh, took out the other two. Uh, it's the first time they've actually been used in a hostile uh, uh, attack. So, um, uh, and significantly, the Lebanese president and prime minister the next day both said, Hezbollah, stop it. We're the government, you're not, and you know, you don't have the say when to start a war with our neighbors. So they were rebuked a little bit but Hezbollah remains the main power in Lebanon. Its military forces are now about twice as strong as the Lebanese government's. It, it controls all of South Lebanon. It's got the tunnels and the whatever. We know it has maybe 150,000 rockets. Every day they're adding these GPS devices to their rockets to make them precision guided missiles that can accurately hit the prime minister's residence in Jerusalem, for instance, or the Knesset or a hospital or a military base uh, before they would just lob them and, you know, some, some wouldn't. Israel has great anti-air uh, defenses and the latest one being a laser beam. It's far less expensive than the current Iron Dome system, which costs $80,000 every time it's fired. So during the war last May, a year ago May, uh, when Hamas sent uh, 4,000 rockets in, that cost Israel millions and millions and millions of dollars. And fortunately, the Biden administration said we'll help uh, resupply those uh, rockets uh, with our ally. Well, praise God for that. But um, otherwise, Biden's been a little lukewarm on Israel. And uh, I, I might talk about that if there's if there's time. But um, uh, so that that's the situation. And Israel remains uh, on basically full war alert, um, they staged, some of you will know, the chariots of fire exercises throughout the month of May, the largest exercises ever in Israel's history, uh, air, sea, and land. Uh, the U.S. brass, top brass, came and they were observing some of this. They did earlier some flying missions with U.S., British, French, uh, Greek, even Indian uh, jets. Participated. They've done naval maneuvers with all of those also in the Red Sea. Um, uh, there's a, a lot going on, but Israel's getting as prepared as they can, uh, but uh, the leadership knows. And I have to say that the outgoing government didn't get much done, but they did take a pretty firm stand on Hamas, firmer, frankly, than Netanyahu had taken. Every time there was anything from Gaza, they responded without then they announced beforehand that would be their policy and they, they kept to it. And um, uh, the same with Iran. They've basically been pointing out, as Netanyahu did, that the Iranian nuclear program continues apace, in fact, uh, much apace. Uh, the talks in March uh, to restart the uh, limitation treaty with uh, five nations with Iran uh, have now basically collapsed. So that isn't going to happen. So they continue to build ballistic missiles and prepare for that. And Israel continues to <clears throat> prepare to take them out. But these, um, these laser beam weapons are fantastic. It's true Star Wars. Uh, it doesn't cost much. It's just the electricity for the, the beam to go up and back. It's not nothing, but it's nowhere near the cost of the Iron Dome. And they have tested it. It seems to be very accurate in hitting its targets and these beams can travel quite a distance. So, um, you know, they're gonna do what they can whenever this war comes, but it's pretty much on the, on, the, on the menu. Everybody is being told by the leaders of Israel, it's going to happen at some point and we'll do our best and you do your best to be ready. And uh, they continue to step up their internal home command, especially after last year's 
terrible violence in uh, Arab Israeli cities during the war and in, not just in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Of course, we had a bunch of rioting again this May up on the Temple Mount and uh, you know, Israel's taking it over and whatever and uh, all the things that they say. So they're, they're keeping everybody all riled up for this uh, coming war. But I want to get back to the states for a second. I think that the um, the uh, greatest threat that America faces is a nuclear one, obviously that is, but that it will come um, from a submarine attack, a surprise submarine launched missile attack on probably our major uh, coastal cities, certainly DC, New York, uh, our ports, cities uh, probably, uh, which of course includes Seattle. I have a lot of family still over there. And my friend Liz Stubbs, I saw, is watching today, is participating. I invited her to do that. I don't know if she introduced herself, but she heads the Ask Prayer Movement in Washington State. It's a, a women's prayer network uh, that used to be called Lydia, uh, and uh, I knew it as that in Israel. Excellent ministry, and um, she prays a lot. She prays a lot for Israel. So <laughs> she goes often to Highland Slobokan's congregation in uh, the Seattle area and knows him and Rita very well. I know they're on your radio station, which by the way, I'll just say, I continue to listen to Messianic Joy. It's wonderful. I love hearing all these, as I mentioned last time, a lot of these people are my friends. And to see them, uh, we just saw Marty Guest, to see him with his daughter. We've seen that with Joel Chernoff. We've seen that with so many of them that their children are now singing and they're now you know, on recording and keeping on that tradition. It's wonderful. And I knew most of them when they were kids. Uh, saw them at the messianic conferences, et cetera. So it's wonderful. But um, uh, so keep listening, everyone, to that. That's a great, great station. Tell others about it. But um, the um, uh, now I lost my train of thought. Let's see if I have it in the notes here. Uh, just, just that the, um, just that the uh, a missile attack from a submarine. You couldn't say who did it. Is it North Korea? They now have that capability. Is it China? They certainly do. Is it Russia? They do. Is it Iran? They are going to be joining a naval exercise south of America, the United States. Their Navy is maybe not got nuclear capability, but these other countries do. So you wouldn't be able to say who had launched it unless they took credit for it, which eventually might happen. But so who, who does the American military respond to? You know, who did it? And, and, and how do we respond? So uh, it, it would be devastating. I think it, it may well happen. And I think that the harbingers of that, as Jonathan says all the time, they continue to point to, uh, uh, like in ancient Israel, God saying, look, you are a special people. I set you up. I endowed you with greater um, mercy, maybe than other countries, greater freedoms. Um, you know, a Christian nation in its inception, even though that was never officially proclaimed, and now many deny that it even ever was the case, but uh, certainly today it's not. Over half the people never go near a church, uh, Washington State being the largest, the biggest number of people that never, I think it's like 38% uh, at the most on Easter, and it's normally less than 30%, and um and both the left and right coasts, <laughs> if I could put it that way, are that way uh, more and more godless. Uh, and that's all the violence we see. And, you know, the demand for the right to, you know, kill your child in your womb and uh, all the things that, that are uh, characteristic of America. And, and, you know, the greatest exporter of the gospel, it was, uh, I'm not so sure anymore, but it was but definitely now the greatest exporter of pornography on earth and um, uh, other things that are very satanic, very detrimental. There are satanic temples and churches opening up all over the places along with mosques and other things going up all over the country. So it's not, certainly not the America I remember from the, my youth in the late fifties and sixties uh, when things started to go in this direction, actually, when I was just uh, a boy, but um, in recent decades have totally accelerated. Now TV is full of filth and of course the internet, we're using it for a Zoom meeting, for a congregational meeting, 
but any kid today can go on and get the most vile things to come up and you can put in filters and this and that let me tell you older people <laughs> the kids can get around a lot of that and um and uh, you know violence and pornography and different things that are going on uh, there's good stuff and we can keep praying for revival and keep hoping for mercy for this country uh, and we pray for that i think we had a bit of a respite from the move towards the new world order as they're calling it or the uh, the great um uh, what's it called uh, well, my mind's gone blank here but uh, you're all switching off your mutes to tell me but uh at any rate, it's uh, uh, it's in God's hands, and we'll continue to pray for his mercy, but I frankly expect now that at some point the Lord's going to allow at least some sort of setback, major setback, major rebuke for America's growing godlessness and uh, growing violence and, and, and et cetera that's going on. And, uh, you know, we, we need to be in prayer about that and not to panic or anything, but just to uh, keep it in mind. And uh, Putin is, I think, going to be the um, initiator of the whole thing. So, uh, and of course, we had uh, COVID and all of those other things. So, um, and uh, the United States, so <laughs> the most wealthy a large country on earth with the greatest medical system had one of the worst death tolls and percentage wise as well as actual death toll in the world. I mean, who would have thought? Um, I think that was a judgment too. I think the Lord allowed that and he warned me that was coming as I mentioned last time already in 2017 that something was coming from Asia that would be very, very detrimental. <clears throat> but I wanna just say this, that the COVID lockdown uh, I live on seven and a half acres, family land that I inherited from my late father and my brothers next door. One I just mentioned, uh, son is a son-in-law is an Air Force pilot and was a former pastor. And um, beautiful land, trees and lots of grounds. And I have gardens and I have my olive trees and all of these things. But um, uh, so I, I sheltered here, as it were. And I said from the beginning of it, uh, it's a mistake to keep the kids out of school, to shut down businesses, etc. This just doesn't affect young people in any way. We knew that right away, like it does older, more vulnerable people, especially elderly, especially with any other conditions. And I said, and I'm one of them, I'm 67 with a heart condition and high blood pressure. I said, we need to get out of the way and stay away from the restaurants and the schools and the, you know, et cetera. We need to isolate ourselves and let the kids, you know, do their thing. And now I think that's a consensus that the lockdowns did more harm to the kids than COVID did in, in various ways. And some of the violence I think we're seeing from teenagers, shootings, mass shootings and stuff is partly uh, that everybody's so riled up and so, you know, a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, uh, the economy going crazy. And of course, the response of the Biden administration to COVID was to, you know, print trillions of dollars. Well, you don't actually print them. It's all on computers, but make, make up money uh, out of thin air and borrow for, in the future to pay it back. Well, you all know, I'm sure we're so in debt, this country now, it's, we'll never get out of it. And now that the interest rates are rising because inflation as a result of all this massive dumping of trillions of dollars everywhere uh, is, uh, is crazy. And it's bad all around the world, but it's, uh, it's President Biden says the opposite, but it's the highest in the United States. And, um, and it's because of the uh, collapsing dollar. I say it's not inflation, it's deflation of our currency. It's losing its value every day. I lived through the hyperinflation in Israel in the 1980s when the shekel was devalued twice a day, every weekday, twice a day in the morning, the Bank of Israel would say, today it's worth this many dollars and this many uh, marks and this many pounds. And this afternoon we'll give you the new figure and tomorrow morning another one. So when I would get my CBS paycheck, I would go into the old city cash it into dollars, and then, then immediately 
take whatever bills I had in shekels, immediately translate those into that day's shekel and immediately pay everything. Because if you waited the next day, you would lose 5%. If you waited a week, you'd lose 20%. I mean, it was over a thousand percent at one point, the inflation there. And brilliantly, the way the Israelis dealt with it is uh, the a thousand shekel co uh, bill, which there was a thousand shekel, uh, they took the three zeros off overnight. Uh, Shimon Peres did this. He was finance minister. And that became the new one shekel note. Uh, so what was formerly a thousand shekels was now one. Overnight that happened. And something like that could happen here to the dollar. Gee, I don't want to get too scary, but uh, I think we, we need to be in great prayer for uh, Israel facing this war with Iran and, and, and Syria and Russia really now clearly uh, going to be backing that and China and uh, for the United States and these challenges that uh, our country faces, the least popular president in history. Uh, the other thing, the border, uh, a lot of people don't realize that Hezbollah has been very active in Central and South America for many years now. They've been setting up camps and they recruit they convert uh, uh, Catholics mainly to Islam. They're very similar, actually, in some ways, the two religions. And then they prepare them to be jihad soldiers. And a lot of those young males crossing the border from Mexico every day, uh, I'm sure, have some affiliation with that. They're getting thousands of sleeper cells set up because the Biden administration refuses to uh, close off the border. And uh, Trump was, of course, in the process of doing that, and it, it all got stopped. So Texas is trying to defend the whole country <laughs> uh, at the moment and being heavily criticized for it from, from the left. But at any rate, um, uh, we need to be in prayer. We've got all these big problems. Now, some people think that um, uh, Gog and Magog may be the next thing we're going to see on the um, uh, world stage uh, prophetically. Uh, I've written about that. Uh, I think I mentioned it last time, but I didn't go into any detail, but I've written about that in my book, Israel in Crisis, why I don't think that's the case. Uh, as I read Ezekiel 38 and 39, where that prophecy is, uh, it's definitely a coalition led by Russia. Iran's definitely involved. Some North African countries are involved. Uh, Syria and uh, Iraq, as I said, Assyria are are involved and Turkey uh, seems to be involved, uh, maybe some other countries in that area. Uh, it's not, not all of them are clear, but uh, some of them are very clear, particularly Persia, Iran. And so in other words, there, this next war, if there is one with Russia and Iran, I don't see that as being the final one with those two parties. It will be a prelude as it were to that later on, because Ezekiel says that Israel will be at peace when this happens, no threats. Well, that's not the case now, uh, obviously. Uh, in other words, they won't have Assyria threatening them because I think Isaiah 17 will have taken place before then. And uh, more importantly, it says that at the end of that war, the Lord brings back all the rest of the remaining Jews, those of you in Spokane and ever, back to the land, back to the Lord's land, the promised land, and uh, there will be no more war, no more. In other words, it's the end. It's after the Antichrist rule. It's after the final events connected to the beast and the Antichrist, the 200 million uh, soldiers that come in from the East. Undoubtedly, China would be a large part of that and other Muslim countries, Indonesia, Pakistan, Iran itself, to the East, Iraq would be part of that. But um, <clears throat> that is going to happen, but not, I think, until the very end of the tribulation period. And I uh, think it's synonymous with Armageddon, because if you read uh, the description in Revelation of what happens at the end of Armageddon, the vultures coming and eating the dead bodies, and the different things, exactly what's stated in Ezekiel uh, for the result of that uh, invasion. So I think the two things are synonymous. So you might say, some would say, some are saying, I wished I could say, <laughs> truthfully, that the next prophetic event is the rapture, is the catching up of the body of Yeshua to be with him in the clouds and 
um, to remain with him until his uh, formal return, as it were, uh, to Jerusalem, descent to Jerusalem, uh, to the Mount of Olives, as it says uh, in uh, the book of Acts, the place he left. Why are you looking up, people? He's coming right back here uh, to the same place. Biden's going to be there next week, by the way, on the Mount of Olives. He's visiting the Augusta Victoria Hospital there. Where I've been several times, a Palestinian hospital. It'll be the first time an American leader has gone to anywhere in the Jerusalem area other than East Jerusalem itself it, it, proper and uh, the old city, I should say. And um, he is insisting that no Israeli people accompany him up there. They want to go up there with him. And he's saying no. So we'll see what happens there. But, um, but the rapture, uh, I believe there will be a catching up and it will be at the last trumpet. As uh, Marvin Rosenthal wrote in his book, uh, the pre-wrath rapture of the church, I think it's then, it's when the wrath of God is poured out. The body will not, the body of Yeshua will not endure the wrath of God. It states that very clearly. I agree that is the case. But the wrath of God isn't the initial wars, the Syria war or the Antichrist even. Uh, those are, you know, things that are going to happen, but the, the wrath is when the bowls of wrath are from God himself poured out upon the whole earth and judgments are det detailed there in Revelation. Uh, as I've said, I I've, I've thought this was the correct position biblically, the, the most valid position. As I studied uh, in college in Spokane, I was taught the pre-trib rapture, and many of my friends still hold to that. And uh, I hope it's true. I, I'm not looking for tribulation any more than any of us are, I think, or upheaval. I'm not particularly looking forward to uh, people being beheaded, believers being beheaded by this world leader that's going to come and with his false prophet, lying false prophet, doing supposed miracles and all of that. Uh, but um, I think the scriptures support a pre-wrath uh, uh, um, rapture. Uh, and then the saints are caught up to be with the returning Lord, visibly returning, as he said himself in Matthew 25, all eyes will see it from lightning, like from lightning east to west. The whole world will see his coming and uh, the, he doesn't come secretly once and snatch people and then go back, you know, but that they meet him in the air and then descend with him to Jerusalem. And, um, and of course, the resurrection of the departed saints takes place at that point, too. So uh, that's what I think. Hope I'm wrong. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, I, I'll end with this. I think the, um, the signs of the uh, second coming are everywhere. The signs of the uh, fulfillment of these prophecies, detailed prophecies, are just massively growing. Even 10 years ago, China wasn't in place. Russia was not anywhere near doing what it's doing now on a larger scale. They were already invading Ukraine and other places, their, their former states uh, that they controlled. But uh, uh, North Korea is now much more powerful. Iran's much more powerful. And uh, other things are, and America continues to decline in power and influence. And the dollar, I think, has just begun its collapse and they will replace it with digital currencies like the Chinese are doing that can be traced. <laughs> they can know everything you're doing. And uh, so that's part of the, the worldwide economic system that was prophesied is now there. It's all in place. Uh, so it's just a matter of the Lord's giving the go ahead, the Lord giving the go ahead for uh, the harbingers to be um, fulfilled. But I wanna just say the one last thing, I mentioned the COVID lockdown and I was here in all the land and whatever and I didn't feel isolated at all. I felt blessed to be on a lake. I could go out in my boat. I could, in the summer, have guests sitting outside because my cardiologist, a Ukrainian Jewish woman, uh, told me, don't you get COVID with the blood pressure you have in your age? So I've been avoiding it. And uh, I mentioned last time I lost my brother last October, one of my brothers, to it. So I take it quite seriously. But in the summer, I have guests outside in the patio and been able to do that and see my brother lives next door and his wife and his kids are out all the time. So, so I, I didn't feel isolated in that sense. But I did stay away from church uh, for that time from our, our local church here. If there was a Messianic congregation here, I'd go to it. But I go to a home group headed by 
a couple that have been to Israel 14 times and they love Israel, know a lot about it. They know Highland and, and uh, Rita and others in the movement. So um, I get that every week, but I wasn't even going there for a while. And I, but I didn't feel isolated. I felt that that time brought me closer to God. Uh, my pastor was um, on television and I watched the different things on the uh, computer, but you know, projected it up to the TV and uh, uh, worship. I would tape some different worship things on television, on the Christian channels and watch those for worship, sing along. And of course, when you're in your house in your, in your t-shirt and uh, uh, sometimes just socks and underwear and a t-shirt, you know, don't tell anyone, but uh, you can sing your heart out and you can sound good or bad and you can scream and yell and dance and jump up and down. I like to do all those things. So uh, my local church here doesn't quite have that as features. So I felt I drew much closer to the Lord during that time. And it's still going on, of course, COVID, it's not gone, but the lockdowns are mostly gone. But um, it just drew closer to him. And also, of course, I'm getting closer to my uh, date of departure. And, you know, I say to people, your, your ra the rapture could be today. Maybe you're right. But your departure could be today either way. The Lord could call you at any time. And when we get into our latter half of life and you get into the 60s, some of you maybe know about this already, one or two of you, the rest of you will and your bodies start falling apart more and more and uh, the aches and pains just don't stop. And uh, doing little things, planting a garden becomes a chore and this sort of thing. I have somebody younger mow my lawn these days, but um, uh, it, it's made me focus a lot more on the reality of the Lord, the reality of, um, of the kingdom of heaven, the reality of the new, kingdom on earth that's coming when the Lord physically is present in Yerushalayim again and and his kingdom is established and he rules the whole world in shalom and everyone sits under their vine and fig tree and uh, I've also got grapes of course growing out there and their olive tree and they uh, do it in peace no more war weapons of war turned into uh, you know um, implements of farming, et cetera. So uh, I look forward to that, to the Lord's coming, always did. Even, you know, my first years as a believer, obviously I was ready whenever he was, but now that it's uh, clearly I'm, you know, close, closer to that uh, reality uh, of leaving here and being in his presence to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's much better as Paul said, uh, I'm looking forward to that more and more every day, and uh, I hope everyone listening feels the same way. And as I shared last time, if you don't know him, you happened upon this on YouTube or something, and you don't know the Lord, get to know him. Call out to him. Cry out to him. Uh, he's your Lord. He's your Savior, and he's the only Lord and Savior. There's not another. There's no other path to the Father but through the son, Ben David, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua our Messiah. God bless you all at Olive Tree and anyone else listening and lives back on the coast and uh, Godspeed and uh, keep looking up. He's coming back and uh, he's going to end this sin sick world and replace it uh, with a new age where righteousness and peace dwell. God bless you all. Shalom. Thank you for joining Olive Tree Community Spokane for today's message. Join us for 24-7 Messianic music and teaching just like this on Messianic Joy Radio. Go to live365.com or download the app Live 365 and search for Messianic Joy. Shalom from Olive Tree Community Spokane.